Welcome to Berkshire Green Drinks. Uh, this event is sponsored and organized by Berkshire Environmental Action Team, also known as BEAT. Um, if you don't already know about us, definitely grab one of our end of year newsletters. Um, and for online folks, you can visit our website, thebeatnews.org. Uh, we're a small nonprofit based in Pittsfield. Next month's Green Drinks uh, is taking place on Wednesday, June 12th. Uh, Daniel Hanshi is going to talk about the art of wildlife tracking. Um, and that's taking place uh, at Dorothy's restaurant in Pittsfield. Um, and it's also online. And you can find out more about that on our website. You can also register on our website and RSVP. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. There are many upcoming events that be, uh, is both organizing and just uh, tabling at and a part of in the next few months, but definitely the next month and a half. Uh, so definitely check those out on our website as well. Uh, I think that's everything. So I'm gonna hand it off to Linda Mary, our speaker this evening, and she can introduce herself a little more. Oh, also, uh, sorry, everyone on, um, everyone on Zoom, if you could please stay muted during the presentation. If you have any questions, definitely put those in the chat and I'll relay those to Linda uh, during the Q&A. Right. Great. Hi there, my name is Linda Mary, and tonight we're going to uh, talk about cliff swallows in uh, northeastern North America. And as you can see by the uh, presentation here, these are my notes in case I forget things as we move along. And for the two of you who aren't acquainted with cliff swallows, um, they're migratory aerial insectivores, uh, cliff swallows commonly build their jug-shaped mud nests on cliffs. However, in the eastern US, um, they do them on eaves of buildings and underneath bridges. Uh, cliff swallow populations initially uh, peaked out during the 1800s as land was cleared for agriculture and as um, the Industrial Revolution took off, they began to decline somewhat and as you know more and more uh, human uh, related uh, activities continued um, their populations continued to decline as well okay well here's a little about the cliff swallow um, they are highly sociable and very very cute i find them you know kind of like mischievous little imps so if you're into, you know, that kind of um, fairy folklore and you can kind of just stretch your imagination um, to that place, if you go and watch a colony of these cliff swallows, um, you'll totally see what I'm talking about. Um, cliff swallows um, are really, really, I don't know, they have like a, a bonding community I really admire. Um, if one of them finds a food source during hard times, it'll come back and do various yip calls or peep calls, or I'm not even squeak calls, there it is, um, to let the others know there's a food source. And they all work together to uh, chase it down. You know, it could be like it was a bad year or the wind's up and you can't keep tabs of where, you know, the, um, uh, the thermals are, where, you know, the insects that they like to feast on happen to be. Um, and so I just, I just find that quite admirable. Also, cliff swallows may forage in areas up to four miles away from the nest site. This is mostly prior to having uh, young. Um, they forage as a loose unit. And basically that just means they're way spread out, ducking and diving, and they look like sometimes they look like this big vortex of birds it was it's really it's spectacular to behold um once they have you know they're young then it's pretty much all business and it's like a well-oiled machine going in and out and you know feeding their young and getting what needs to be done done both sexes do participate in nest building carrying mouthfuls of mud and clay um, construction is accomplished in five to 14 days, give or take for weather um, and whatever uh, else might be going on in their nesting environment. 
Okay, so we'll go through natural nest construction by the cliff swallow, step one. Step one, here it is. They're grabbing themselves a mouthful of mud. Step two, they fashion the mud into little pellets and they plaster them along the sides and all along the structure of the nest. It's really admirable masonry work if you really think about it. And then of course, like a good mason, when you lay something out like that, you gotta let it dry and cure. So they do that for a bit, there it is wet, there it is after it dried up a bit, and then they're getting ready to come back and finish it off. Um, they do numerous trips to the uh, build their nest. It's probably somewhere between 500 and 1,000 pellets. So that's probably at least 500 or so trips to the mud puddle, getting these things out. They really bust their keisters. And once they get the outside done, they want to make the interior nice and cush. So you got some grasses and hair and feathers, and they throw all that in the nest to make it really nice for the youngins. And voila, here it is. Here's a finished nest. After all that work, ah, it's a thing of beauty. Huh, that's weird. I guess I liked it so much I'm doing it twice. <laughs> Ah, here we go. Well, what exactly is an aerial insectivore? Aerial insectivores are birds that only catch flying insects in flight. Um, you know, you have things like uh, warblers and bluebirds where they might, you know, sally occasionally, but sometimes they'll glean off of branches or pick stuff up from the ground, whatever they're into eating. These guys only do flying insects and they fly out to get them, hence the name. Huh, how do I do that? Anyways, okay, well, we have a couple types of aerial insectivores. We have our hawkers and that's our swallows, swifts and nighthawks. Okay, well, anyways, we covered the, um, uh, the hawkers. And then these are the salliers, our um, flycatchers, phoebes, and kingbirds. And basically what they are, they're kind of like the ambush hunters, where they'll just perch on somewhere, and then a flying insect will come over and they'll jump out and get it, and then go back and take a rest. It's not nearly as labor intensive as a hawker. So you really gotta you know, hand it to them for you know, doing it efficiently and um, being very relaxed while they do that. I admire that. Oh, wink. Oh. So what's so great about aerial insectivores? I'm glad you asked. We didn't ask. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get down to the uh, nitty gritty of the ecological value of insectivores like swallows. Swallows as a group are very effective at natural pest control. For example, an adult tree swallow, which likes to nest in tree cavities, but will use nest boxes, can eat up to 2,000 insects per day and can catch an additional 3,000 for a brood of nestlings. An adult barn swallow can consume 60 insects per hour, 12 hours a day. Uh, that's around 32,400 insects per nesting cycle. And according to an energetics model, an adult purple martin, another relative of the cliff swallow, can eat 412 billion insects, a biomass of 115,860 metric tons. That's based on a million individuals on a 45-day uh, nesting cycle. That's about 41,200 insects per bird. That's a lot of insects. Makes you wonder how big they are though, you know? Like, do they catch less if they're catching big ones? Do you wonder stuff like that? I know I do. So here's the rundown, purple martin. 
uh, 915.56 insects a day. I guess that means, you know, their abdomen up. Tree swallow, 2,000 insects per day. Barn swallow, 720 insects a day. An average of 1,212.85, that's missing the head, insects per day based on a 45-day nesting cycle. With a median of 915.56, half a bug. It's a safe estimate about a thousand insects per day might be consumed by cliff swallows. Um, pardon me? Are they going after the same insects or are they looking for different? We'll get to that. <laughs> That's intriguing, but how are cliff swallows as parents? Subliminal hint. Cliff swallows are very devoted parents. Uh, both male and female feed the nestlings. Mostly, there's three or four observed in the nest, but there could be as many as six. Personally, I usually see three or four of them. On a bad year, you might see two, maybe three, like that. It varies with season to season. Um, the parent cliff swallows are very conscientious about ensuring each bird in the nest is fed. Yeah, but how do they know which one needs to be fed next? This is going to be a little tough to see, but I'm going to give it a whirl anyways, because you know what? There's a lot of value on falling in your face, you know? So here we go. Which bird has been fed? As it turns out, parent birds can tell by looking into the gape of the cliff swallow nestlings to see who's been fed and who needs to be fed. The fed nestling will have a duller gape color like the image shown here. And I will point this out to you because it might be hard to see. This one has a slightly brighter gape than this one here, which looks a little bit washed out. You may or may not be able to see that, but what happens is when the gape gets um, dull like that, that's an indicator that it has already been fed because the circulation and energy um, is getting drained from you know, the bright, bright, bright pressure of the gape into digesting the food that it's already eaten. And so just by our eyeballs, that'll tell you that young needs to be fed next. Now, can you tell who's been fed? Is it hard to see? On the far right? Yep. And what's really interesting is if you spend a lot of time looking at these things, I can almost tell the order they've been fed in um, based on how bright it is. And it's actually kind of hard to see that. Um, but this one has like, this one's faded out. This one's not quite as colorful. And then this one is the brightest one of all. So you can tell that one in the middle probably is the one that needs to be fed next. Now, who's been fed? We're going to let mama or papa decide who's been fed. Can you, can you, can you, do you think which one needs to be fed there? The one on the right's been fed? Okay, let's find out. Yep, the one on, the one on the left here has been fed, and this one on the right is not happy about it. But they're like that. Okay, one more. Who's been fed? Yeah, it's hard to tell. Here comes Papa. <laughs> All right. Ah, there we go. As it turns out, the visible spectrum perceived by human beings is not the only light that birds can see. Birds like cliff swallows can also see an ultraviolet. So even if we can't see the difference in color um, in the gape, um, the parent birds can see what we can't. Okay, now time for the, aw, oh, that didn't show up. Oh, that's too bad. All right, I have a fledgling anecdote and I had a little video here that I popped up on the side, but it's not showing up on my, um, my presentation. So there might be some kind of conflict there. Sorry, you'll just have to have the stills. Okay, well, during 
the years I've spent looking at these birds, I've noticed three distinct um, cliff swallow fledging behavioral types. So we're going to talk about that. Okay, you're hearing some cliff swallow sounds and this is fledging time. Okay, and I was playing that because I wanted you to kind of get a feel for um, the kind of excitement that gets built um, during fledging time. I don't know what they're thinking or what they're saying, but it's kind of like going to, uh, I don't know, a big concert or something where, you know, the energy is just like, you know, anyways. Okay, when fledging time arrives, an aura of excitement envelops the cliff swallow colony. This brings us to fledging behavior type one. The hopped up excitement incites the more fearless nestling to jump headlong from the nests. There's one. Whether they're ready or not. That one was ready, that one was not so ready. Most immature cliff swallows who have not developed adequate plumage impulsive, that impulsively leap in this way do not survive. Uh, the resulting carcasses provide food for other animals like crows and foxes. And we got like um, my gray fox friend who is cleaning up the mess for us, you know, and tastes like chicken. I mean, you know, you can't blame them. Fledging behavior type two. Parent birds will tease the nestlings, usually using tactics such as going through the motions of feeding the chick, like over here. And this bird didn't actually have any food in its mouth. It's just trying to get it to come out of the nest and it's going, feed me, feed me, feed me. The next thing that it also does is it'll grab a mouthful of food and just keep it out of the nestlings reach. Kind of like playing like a na 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 na. Gets the bird really mad. And it irritates the nestling to the point where they lunge headlong out of the nest and start chasing down whatever parent happens to have the food item. Um, if you've ever gone to a cliff swallow colony or even some kind of swallow colony and see the two birds duking it out in the air in July, uh, late June, something like that when they're fledging, most often that's what's happening is it's the somebody's getting fledged and they do eventually get rewarded with the food for a job well done then we have fledging behavior type three and this is the nestling who is rather risk averse uh, perhaps maybe one of its nestlings was a type one and saw an untimely demise. Um, or maybe, you know, this individual has a relaxed disposition and is resistant to false feeding and being teased and is just happy to stay put. And as you can see by this image here, this individual wants no part of leaving. And I'm going to set this up here. And so we got one parent bird here. And then we got another parent bird in the back. Now this image coming up next is a little, eh, but you might be able to see what's going on here. All right. So you saw the first setup. What happens is one of the follow swallows flies into the nest and gets behind the nestling. The other adult gets on top of the nest and all you can see right here is the wing who's getting into ready position. And what the one bird does is it puts its foot on the nestling's back. And then what it eventually does is it kind of like grabs the scruff of its neck with its, you know, with its beak. And then it just kind of like gives it the heave ho out of the nest. And what happens is when the swallow is pushed out of the nest 
as a matter of a reflex, it automatically sticks its wings out like this. While all that is going on, this is like, you know, just inside of a second or two, the other parent swoops down from the top of the nest behind the individual nestling who's just gotten booted out of the nest, comes up behind it and helps it out with its first flight. Very much like a dolphin does when it's lifting its calf for its first breath of air. And if you go to a cliff swallow colony and you happen to see some kind of weird swooping behavior and you'll see like two birds doing something like that, that's exactly what's going on. It just got booted out of the nest. Okay, well, it's not all kittens and puppies. And this is the more somber reality check here. Uh, the number of cliff swallows in the northeastern sector of North America have been slowly decreasing since the Industrial Revolution. This decline has really steepened since the mid to late 1990s. Uh, one of the factors, of course, is imported house sparrows um, outcompete the cliff swallows for their nests and are rather vicious about it. Um, habitat loss. Northeastern farmlands disappear. Some open land revert back to forest, which is certainly great for woodland birds, but eh, not so much for the uh, um, swallows. Uh, lo loss of source mud. Vegetation might grow in or the source mud might get covered up in asphalt. Um, decrease in insect prey. Um, a lot of biocidal use. Um, nest structure failures, maybe what few nest sources there are left have too sandy a composition. A lot, a lot of stuff going on. And yeah, here's an image. And you're probably wondering why I'm using an old stat. And the reason why I can do this is because things haven't changed. And again, because things have to say, actually, this kind of looks a lot more optimistic than it is. Um, they peak, the cliff swallows peaked out at about 36 confirmed nests in 1975. And as of last season, there was only 12. And uh, a few of them are here. There's a couple of them here. And as far as I know, there isn't anything here, and there might be one or two over here. But that's it. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, it was an impulse. OK, this is also um, my issue is you know the uh, biocidal use that um, is decreasing the prey of the birds. Um, yeah, they got to eat, you know, if you starve them out, you know, you I realize, you know, people, it's like, yeah, you don't want to have, you know, bad insects harboring diseases and things like that. But there is a, there is a middle ground. Um, you don't want to starve out other species that might depend on it. Um, yeah, pripronal butoxide. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It's making me so depressed. <laughs> and yeah, this is some pretty hairy stuff, especially when they mix that in because um, they make it sound like, oh, you're only using an itty bitty little bit. But you know, uh, you're not really, it's, it's, it's deceptive marketing. I'm sorry, but it is. And one of the easiest ways to, um, spot deceptive marketing is when they say things like very small amounts of blah, 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 and then they say whatever their thing is whenever they mention that that's a tip off that you have a chemical cocktail with a synergist in it and that sh alarm should go off in your head when you hear it because that's not really a that's not really what you want to do um, another misleading con, uh, comment you'll hear 
is it will kill, well, they say flying mosquitoes in this ad, but it's even any, you know, what they call pest on contact. You know, when they say that, they don't make chemicals targeting just once. It only kills mosquitoes. No, it doesn't only kill mosquitoes. It kills anything and everything that happens to be some kind of flying arthropod or even a walking one. And if you think about it, if it's gonna do that to an insect, sooner or later, it's gonna hurt us too. That's just the way it is. I didn't make the rules. I didn't even make these chemicals. It's just, it's just the way things work. Okay, you depressed yet? I am, and Insects always get the last laugh. Why? Because they're more simply constructed than we are. What does that mean? That means they develop resistance. Yay, insects. Oh, that's a bad thing to say. No. But they, we have three basic types of resistance that they um, develop. One of them is target site resistance. Due to a mutation, changes occur in the shape of neuroreceptors of the insect. So when you're blasting them with some kind of chemical agent that's supposed to hit that, it's almost like denaturing something where that target no longer fits. And so it doesn't do anything. Metabolic resistance. An insect can detoxify itself of the chemical agent. It's a lot like going out to a bar and getting stinky drunk, and then a couple days later, you find you have to have more drinks to get as stinky drunk as you were that first time you went out. That, in a nutshell, is metabolic resistance. And then we have cuticular resistance, which is one of my favorites because um, long ago in another lifetime, I used to fix cars and I touched hot things and I developed many, many calluses. So I totally bond with the concept of cuticular resistance. It's the thickening of the epicuticle. It's a lot like developing calluses. Yay bugs. Okay, well, uh, 2011 study conducted at Columbia University and published in the journal Pediatrics found that infants whose mothers had been exposed to low levels of pipronal butoxide during their third trimester showed delayed mental development by the age of three. Now that's some scary stuff. In short, a compromised food supply is also correlated with the population declines of aerial insectivores. So we who are passionate about swallow conservation are addressing the issues that we can. Okay, I can't address the issues with, you know, like the chemicals and stuff, but this is what we can do. And our conservation adventure part one basically was addressing nests falling, uh, lack of quality mud source for nest building, and house sparrows. And this is Romas, the success story, um, and how I actually met Mara Silver, who was actually the brains and the brawn behind this. Um, they were having a problem with nesting success because of the sandy composition of the source mud there. Um, you can see over here, it's all chewed out. Um, the nests don't hold together very well and they were just like falling off the buildings. It didn't help that they were um, you know, adhering the mud to painted surfaces. And so it's not, it doesn't give it the um, stickiness that it needs and it just kind of just peels off and drops. So what she did was she made a whole slew of these um, artificial nests and they totally work. And um, yeah. So the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife up in um, New Hampshire is all over this. They're getting, you know, uh, cliff swallow nests from her every single year. 
So this is just another shameless uh, self-promotion. Yep, there's the juvenile being teased fed again and the smallest <laughs> nestling I had ever seen. So I had to get a Kodak moment off of that. And what we also did is um, we have a few of these under a couple of the bridges in the county. One of them is, this one's at Glendale. We had a rock climber come down and install them for us. We got a blessing from the, uh, uh, what is it, DEP? No. D yeah, DPW, yes, yes, yes. I know what I meant, but yes, thank you, yes. Uh, Department of Public Works gave us the blessing, and so we had um, Steve there putting in the nest for us. And these are some of the things Mara has been coming up with um, when they still naturally build, but the quality of the mud just isn't there. She just made like a little sling for it so that it wouldn't fall off. And it totally works. So I'm going to guess um, this is probably going to be her next um, great prototype, the nest hammocks. Okay, Conservation Adventure Part 2. This is the one about the um, insect prey and lack of quality mud source for nest building. We like the mud, we like the insects. And this is Insect Prey and Diversity Conservation Adventure. And this is basically um, the brainchild of Dr. Sarah Snyder at Simons Rock College. Her and her team of students began an inquiry on this very subject of density and diversity. Did, was it correlated with the size of the colony? Um, as you, some of you may know, Simons Rock has the largest cliff swallow colony in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It may even be the largest one in New England. I can't say that for sure, but I can say for sure the Commonwealth. <laughs> so what she did is um, her and her team deployed Maylie's fly traps in the vicinity of four established cliff swallow colonies, Air Hill Farm, uh, Hall Tavern Farm, New Lenox Road, and Simon's Rock. Hey, it got covered up. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Snyder's preliminary findings are intriguing. The colony size was not correlated with insect mass or diversity, and they will be continuing this inquiry in the 2024 nesting season. However, a large number of Nematocera was found at Simon's Rock than at other colonies. They're an insect that have a aquatic stage and they have highly uns unsaturated omega-3 fatty acids. And it's been found, uh, according to the study in 2018, that that is a predictor of fledging success in tree swallows. And since they tend to pal around together, it's certainly um, easy to make that leap if you want to. Think of, a, think of the insects with highly unsaturated omega-3 fatty acids as perhaps sardines for your swallows. Okay, and there's an image with it. Oh, okay. I must have did something weird when I was uh, putting the thing together. But which factor carries the most weight? Is it the house sparrows, the source mud, the compromised insect prey. Um, interestingly, all of these previous factors do carry significant weight. Uh, Berkshire Community College, where I work at Pittsfield, Mass, was once the second largest cliff swallow nesting colony in the Commonwealth. Due to multiple factors, BCC is no longer a primary cliff swallow nesting colony. However, BCC still remains an occasional secondary late season nesting colony. Ah, okay, well, we're going to go take a walk down memory lane now. Uh, nearly 25 years has passed since I had taken ENV 127 with Dick Farron. He's the guy. See him? My thing about cliff swallows? 
Blame him. <laughs> okay. Anyways. In the late 1990s, there were probably at least 25 nesting pairs of cliff swallows on the BCC campus. I learned back then that BCC was the second largest cliff swallow colony in the Commonwealth at that point. In 1999, the fire road was not paved at this time, an ample supply of source mud to the cliff swallows was available for nest construction. The number of cliff swallows remained relatively stable until 2013 when a primary layer of asphalt um, was applied to the final, the fire road. This meant the loss of most of the source mud that was there. Uh, the 2013 nesting season at BCC also saw a mass exodus of the cliff swallows. These birds found temporary nesting at a site in nearby Greenmead's farm. There was plenty of source mud there, but the farm was uh, totally loaded with house sparrows. So by 2021, there were no more cliff swallows at Greenmead's farm. Okay, the renovation work was completed around 2016, and that meant the loss of probably a little over a thousand square feet of source mud that was needed to sustain the cliff swallow colony. So, during a discussion I had with Dick, there he is again, he had indicated to me that he believed that the loss of the source flood was nice bite, played the largest factor in the demise of the cliff swallow colony on the VCC campus than either the decline of the insect prey or an increase in house sparrows. I was a bit skeptical because personally, I thought for sure it was the lack of insect prey. And therefore, that would be more of a deciding factor. Then nesting season 2023 came along to the BCC campus. In the summer of 2023, a better part of the BCC campus was dug up for sewage and drain line replacements. At the same time, a nesting colony in Cheshire, Mass had some nesting failures. Frequent rainfall over June and mid-July resulted in an abundance of mud. So, Farron's hypothesis more clearly stated is the amount of available mud source is correlated to the potential nesting density of a colony. So he said at Berkshire Community College, the loss of mud played again. Nah, 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 nah. I still was a bit skeptical. And as we stated earlier, there's the image of BCC campus getting dug up. Oh no, it rained a lot. Look at all the rain. There's the water. Boom. Come on, it's still raining. Then it receded. When it receded, we had many cliff swallows. Oh, there they are. Look how happy they are. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, is there something to the hypothesis? Let's find out. Okay, part one. Yep, buckets, old mud puddle, filled. Okay. Phase 1A, I acquired some mud. Okay, and come on, you. Part two, portable mud sources. Okay, all right. Long and short of it is, this is at Simons Rock College right now. I don't know how things are going. This is a very recent picture, the end. Any questions? <laughs> I didn't think I used enough slides. We have some kids that have some on Zoom. Those mud wasps, uh, I mean, uh, the nests that were made, the artificial nests, were they made out of a resin or, or what is it? Um, they're made out of clay. So it is, it's all like- Mara throws pottery. That's yes. incredible. Oh, oh, the question was, um, what were the artificial ma nests made from? I 
Yes, like you said. Then am I confusing myself? You're not imagining, but what you're seeing is probably bank swallows, and we would love to know where they are. Okay, the gentleman was uh, talking about some swallows burrowing into um, the ground. Was it near a river? near a bank of a stream and that almost sounds textbook to me like a bank swallow oh um is is this recent uh, no, it's in, in oh because i was like if that was a recent one it's like please talk to us we would love to hear from you because the reality is that bank swallows are doing worse than the cliff swallows mm -hmm. and we would love any tip off that we can get um, so one Zoom question is, do they get parasitized by cowbirds? I haven't seen that happen. Um, the closest parasite that I can think of off the top of my head now that you mentioned it, because I forgot, is ectoparasites. Uh, they do get swallow bugs. Um, they're a lot like bed bugs. And the interesting thing about them is sometimes when a house sparrow takes the cliff swallow's nest away, their nestlings will get swallow bugs and that will cause nesting failures in the house sparrow's nest. Hmm. Interesting. Given the name cliff swallows, why do they nest in cliffs, let's say, on the, on the ocean side, or, or do they do that? Uh, the gentleman wants to know if the cliff swallows nest on cliff sides at the ocean um not to my knowledge um generally the highest population of them are in the uh, central plains region not so much the plains where it's flat but where you start getting the um rocky faces and mountainous regions um so it's kind of like part flat part rocky um montana is a great place to go look for them uh, Nebraska is another great place to look for them. When I asked my question, you said if I see bank swallows to let you know, would you collectively? Who are you collectively? Um, you could let me know. You could uh, contact Mara Silver at uh, swallowconservation.org. Um, that's actually a website. And she has an address on there, and she'd be all over you because, you know, she is like really the guru. Swallowconservation.org, Swallow yes. Mm -hmm. um, a Zoom question is Does someone have to clean out artificial nests from year to year? Ah, we're talking about the Club Med experience. Um, up in Rome, Massachusetts, they are the most loved and cared for and pampered population I have ever seen. And every fall, those nests come down, they get bleached out real good, and then uh, they get put up for the following year. I have a question. No one has one here. Um, so uh, the bridge in Glendale, the one that goes over the Housatonic River, is that the bridge where uh, the artificial nests were put up? Um, they were put up there and they were put up on uh, New Lenox Road. Okay. Um, did, you, did you know that uh, the bridge going over uh, the Housatonic is actually getting replaced? At, they haven't started construction yet, but they're going um, to I soon. did know that. And what's really interesting about that particular site is they only had a successful brood there for one season. Wow. And I don't know why. The only thing that I can maybe guess is the first year um, the nesting became plastered uh, with signs of um, swallow bug infestation. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know whether that was why they had abandoned that colony or what happened, but that was one of those, um, I guess, what I would call the oopsie as far as um, where we decided to place the nest. That, you know, might have not been a good idea in hindsight. Mm -hmm. 
So depending on how they, you know, build the new bridge, um, certainly would determine if that's better habitat for them because, you know, the, the failure rate on account of the mud didn't seem all that, you know, awful, you know, the composition of the mud, yeah. you know, was adequate, you know. Oh, no, no worries. You talked about loss of colonies, you talked about conservation of colonies. You've not talked about establishing new colonies. Is that something that doesn't happen or are you, are you only in the business of establishing what's already there? Well, trying to preserve what's already there, trying to get new colonies would be awesome. And, oh, I'm sorry, I was supposed to, uh, yes, um, the gentleman wants to know about um, preserving old colonies as opposed to establishing uh, new ones. Now, let's see. Okay, I lost my place. What was I saying? I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess for right now, um, we're looking to kind of coax, coaxing the swallows into staying in the spots that we know of for a little bit longer. Um, they're going to do what they're going to do regardless of what we do. I mean, we're just puny humans after all. Uh, I, I got nothing. <laughs> I have a follow-up question. How would you establish a new college? How would I establish a new colony? Um, I've never had that happen. Um, I know it's like Mara would probably be better able to answer this than me, but if it was left to me, disaster, no. If it was left to me, um, I guess what I would do is first be a creepy stalker with the swallows, right? You follow them around, see what they're doing. You gotta, cause that's kind of what you gotta do. Um, and then, you kind of look for something you think they might like. And they're a real hard sell. You know, they like, what do they like? They like a lot of bugs to eat, right? They like a nice flat view. They like to be near water. And ideally you want to have um, a mud source that has just the right composition where it has like some stick to it almost like pottery but not as dense as clay although you know doping your soil with clay is actually really good and then play a bit of music mood music <laughs> uh we have a few questions on zoom um do they add more mud to the artificial nests before nesting they do I, yes they do cool. Um, and could the PCBs in the mud near New Linux Road affect the success of the population? Good question. I haven't seen that. Um, and, and New Linux Road is probably um, the closest one where they keep coming back on a pretty regular basis. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is they've actually increased um, over the past couple of years. Now, I don't know whether, you know, you know, there's reproduction success or maybe some of the ones that are jetting from Glendale are coming up to New Lenox Road or maybe they're going to Simon's Rock, I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to say. What can be done about the house barrel problem because it's not only the the cliff, the swallows that are suffering. I mean, blue birds have problems too, and other. Fear not, 5G is here. <laughs> and according to a study in India, um, there was a bunch of them that came out of India. They found a correlation with microwave radiation, and within three generations, the house sparrows were sterile. <laughs> I don't know if that happened to all the birds, but these these people in India were actually studying um, house sparrows. So, yay, 5G, man. Mm -hmm. Yep. Problem solved. Yay, people. 
Um, do the cliff swallows show preference to returning to previous nest sites slash the areas where they were fledged themselves? That's, that's a hard one without actually banding the birds mm -hmm. and being able to determine that. But I think Charles Brown's study, and that's on um, the Cliff Swallow Project. You, you look that up on the internet. And uh, that team has a slew of studies, probably some 40 plus years of studying Cliff Swallows. And off the top of my head, I don't remember the answer to that question. It either does or it doesn't, and I can't remember. So I, I can't give you an answer on that because I forgot. Oh, Mark, did they migrate in mixed flocks with the swallows or did they stay with themselves? Um, coming north, they might do uh, themselves. Oh, oops. Are they doing mixed flocks um, when they migrate? Coming up north, they may be doing that in a single species. Going down south, on the other hand, when they're going splitting for the fall, it's a mixed flock. It's a big honking mixed flock. It's crazy mixed flock, you know. Um, it's so exciting because um, every now and then when I see them, I'll see a couple of bank swallows. So I'm just like, oh, joy, you know. So there you have it. All right. If there are, aren't any more questions, um, yeah, it looks like it's about to rain here, so I think it's a good time to probably wrap things up. Bye. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs>